You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half of the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. Privacy is important, especially as we get more and more mobile and turn to digital platforms for everything from food ordering to shopping and more. Today, we're joined by two members of the Connexus Data Privacy Working Group to help us learn more about some important regulations and things that affect businesses and consumers. Welcome to Convenience Matters. I'm Carolyn Schneer with Nax. And I'm Jeff Leonard with Nax. And as Carolyn said, we have two guests today to talk about privacy and security. So want to first welcome Paige Anderson. She's the Director of Government Relations at Nax, and Danny Emiliak, who's Senior Consultant at WCAPRA. Welcome both of you. It's great to be here. Thank you for having us. So Danny, I'll start out with you. Um, over the years, we've talked about data breaches and we've talked about data security. That, that's been a big focus. But now it seems there's a little bit more of an evolution to privacy. So can you kind of walk us through wh- how we've gone from looking at security to privacy and what might that mean for fuel retailers or any retailers? Absolutely. That's a great question. So what I'd start out with, you know, is the data security. The focus was, you know, in the last, you know, 30 years or so, we've started collecting a lot more data. And the first initiative was really to help secure the most sensitive data that existed out there. Uh, and if you really think about that, that social security numbers, credit card information, things like that. And what we've seen now as more and more data is collected by organizations, social media platforms, even your own devices, uh, there is now a enhanced need to secure more types of data. And so that's where data privacy comes in. Um, this is data that might not be sensitive, so it doesn't need to be as secure, in, in, for lack of a better term, uh, but it needs to Uh, consumers or individuals need an option to become private if they wish to. Um, And so that's where uh, this data privacy has uh, sprung into the foreground uh, in in many industries. Um, What this really means for uh, consumers is uh, there's different states and countries that are passing laws uh, that enhance consumer rights related to their data. So it uh, expands the scope of data that um, consumers have uh, their access to and uh, that they have control over. So there's things like access requests, which allow them to understand what data a company has on them, uh, deletion requests that allows you to go to an organization say, hey, please delete my data, which all seems like very simple stuff uh, that never existed in the past. So these are all new rights that are coming about uh, and you know, different states are evaluating these laws. The first one, obviously the consumer um, uh, California Consumer Privacy Act uh, in California um, that kind of uh, paved the way in the U.S. for consumer privacy. So f- just following up on that, Danny, uh, and, and we joke about it at home when when these things occur, but you know, it, uh, it's starting to feel a little bit more, ooh, that's a little weird. And what I'm talking about is when, when you'll just have a conversation with somebody uh, about something. Let's just say uh, you're interested in buying uh, something for a pool. And then you go to your social media feed and you start seeing things related to a pool or you go to a home improvement center and you buy something in the paint section. And then you come home and you see that you're getting ads for another brand of paint. Is that what we're talking about with the idea of privacy, where on one hand they're saying, hey, you know, I I know what you're doing and trying to help you out. On the other hand, it feels pretty darn creepy. Yeah, uh, that's probably one of the, the biggest concerns that individuals have is is that privacy and, um, you know, feeling like there's that big brother, someone's always watching you. Um, and and uh, on the flip side, organizations do that to try to target ads that are more relevant to you. Uh, but on the consumer side, sometimes that can feel like you're a violation of your privacy or why did why were you listening to my conversation? Uh, but the goal of it at the end of the day is to provide a better consumer experience. So what we look for, at least when I'm working with organizations on privacy and or talking to individuals is how do we come to that common ground where the uh, individual or the consumer feels comfortable with the data that an organization has and the organization organization uses it in the right ways uh, that don't come off as, uh, for lack of a better term, creepy or um, uh, something like that. I mean, sometimes I 
I, I like it in a way. It's like, oh, good. I didn't have to think about that. Or I forgot to do that. And I, I've talked to friends who who think it's great. I mean, it just it's that much easier. It makes life, you know, and thinking and reminding you to buy the paint or the pool equipment or whatever. Like, oh, I forgot about that. It makes that easier. But then, yeah, you're right. Some people are like, whoa, get out of my space, buddy. <laughs> like, do not follow me. Let me turn everything off, which I guess leads me to a question I had. You were talking about how consumers come in and can request their data. Not Do a lot of people do that? Are there, are there act like a lot of Americans in this case going out there and saying, stop doing my data, you know, writing to companies, asking them to withhold or not take their data, I guess is the right way to say that. Yes. What we've seen is uh, consumers are engaging in, in these um, new rights, but on a small scale. So, and part of that has to do with uh, the amount of states that uh, have passed these rights. It's really only one state, it's California, that allows consumers these different rights. Um, so just from that perspective, there's there's less going on. Uh, but what you'll probably see even in your day-to-day lives uh, is, you know, social media platforms, websites that are tracking what you're doing are making it more visible to you so that you know that they are now collecting your information. I think that's kind of the biggest critique on organizations in the past is consumers weren't aware that they were collecting and storing this information on them. And uh, the, the purpose of this data privacy initiative going on is, is really to solve for that, make sure consumers are aware and make sure that they consent to um, you know, organizations collecting data on them and then using it for targeted advertising, for messaging, things like that. In the past, you know, it was really easy. You knew that if there was a data breach that you had used your credit card at a particular store. And so you knew what information um, that, that the consumer provided. As a retailer, you knew what information you had. But in these days, what you've seen beyond that is you know these privacy issues where there's been so much misuse of a whole lot of consumers' personal information that consumers didn't even know that these companies were collecting this information, selling this information, and in some cases, misusing this information. So the evolution of protecting that information and letting a consumer know if there's been a theft of that information has evolved to, hey, as a consumer, I want to know what information you have, how you're going to use it, are you collecting it, are you selling it, what are you using it for? And if I don't want to give you that information, I want the right to be able to delete or or be able to stop my information from being collected and used in a certain way. So I don't know, Paige, is this a, if this is a shortcut for defining uh, like data breaches were more about your financial information, things that could identify you as a person. And is it that these these um, privacy issues are more related to, say, cookies uh, that are online that are more about your interests? And is that kind of the defining line between security and privacy? A little bit, yes. I mean, it really comes down to what. how do you define personal information? You know, a lot of the discussion has been, okay, can this piece of information identify me, like a social security number or a driver's license number or a credit card number? Or are you looking at my behaviors, such as I clicked and I went on the Williams Sonoma website and the Sur La Tabla website, and I'm buying all kinds of cooking gadgets. And so, as I'm, you know, going to different digital platforms and different other websites and I'm suddenly seeing ads, you may not know it's me, Paige Anderson, but you certainly are gathering um, an image of this type of consumer that is going to these types of websites. And that's the challenge is how do you define certain pieces of information about a consumer. And it's almost a triage effect. There is obviously some information that has more value um, and is more sensitive than other pieces of information. And so how, what rights apply to what pieces of information about that consumer? And in Danny's case, you know, how do you protect different levels of information about that consumer? Yeah. I want to follow up with you, Paige, on, on, protecting the consumer. And, and first off, whoever came up with that word cookie, that, that was brilliant. Take the rest of the day off. <laughs> if somebody had named it like fried liver or something like that, I think people would be up in arms. It's like, I don't want that stuff released. You know, go away. But um, you know, this is about convenience and it's about convenience retailers. So Paige, what are some of the issues that, that convenience retailers need to look at? Danny alluded to California earlier. Um, what's going on in California and 
what do retailers need to do there? And what, what about the other states? Is there something that they need to prepare for or look at? So back in 2018, California has an initiative pro- um, process. So the voters of California passed an initiative that granted six different rights to consumers regarding their personal information. Um, and then the governor signed that into law. There was, an, there was an amendment process with the state legislature. So come January 1st of this year, consumers um, have these rights in place and we're starting, the state is starting to implement um, those regulations surrounding those rights. Um, There's guidance that needs to be provided by the state AG. Um, With the COVID and the pandemic happening, a lot of um, those guidance issues had to, um, were postponed and delayed. Um, But the reality is if, if you're a business doing business in California and you're engaging with California consumers, you have to have, at a minimum, understand what type of information that you're collecting as a business um, and understanding, okay, do I meet certain criteria or thresholds that I have to um, do certain things with this information, such as making sure that there's either a a 1-800 number or an option that a consumer can go in and delete that information. From the convenience side of things, we provide, we have a lot of great loyalty and rewards programs. And the question became, because you can't, you know, discriminate against somebody who wants to um, be able to um, exert their option or their privacy right on their information. You can't discriminate against that person. So the question became, well, if you bought 10 cups of coffee um, and we're, and we're you know, collecting that information and the 11th cup of coffee is free, if I as a consumer decided, you know what, I don't want you to collect my information, would I still be able to take advantage of those loyalty and rewards programs? So there was a big discussion of does that mean discrimination or not discrimination? So even easy, simple things became very complicated um, in the state of California and how to to um, implement these consumer rights surrounding privacy. So the short answer, and and Danny's been spending a lot of time, so I'm going to throw this to him next. Um, You know, in in essence, we suddenly, as an industry, had to become aware that, yes, we indeed do collect information. The question is, you know, what parts of the California law do we have to apply to? Now, the one reason why California is so significant beyond the fact that it's a very cool state and it's very large um, is the fact that other states are really looking at because California went first and other states want to model their state privacy um, rights legislation um, just like California and even at the federal level they're looking at the California model as a potential way to apply to the entire United States so it's a big deal to understand um, what's happening in California and and Danny I know you've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what our retailers whether they're small big or large have to go through to try and comply with this. And I think it'd be a great opportunity to share some of those insights. Yeah, absolutely, Paige. And I think one thing that I would add on, you know, we talk about California, but I don't want to give the wrong impression to retailers that if they aren't operating out of California, that they're not in scope for this law. It's actually not true. Uh, The way that the law is written uh, is that uh, if Uh, the consumers of California, so the individuals that live in California have these rights and they have these rights regardless of where they go. And in the interconnected world we live in, it is not hard to uh, believe that there are people that live or are based out of California that interact with retailers in other states. And these rights apply in those situations. So even if your business is located um, in the Southeast, if you have uh, enough California consumers' personal information, this data applies to you. And so that's where I want to really start is it applies across the country, even though it's a California law, which is really kind of a first of its kind in my mind. And as Paige alluded to, we're expecting more states to fall suit and eventually federal legislation as well. 
Um, but as far as what it means for these retailers, um, th- there's a series of operational changes that you have to make in order to meet the requirements of these data privacy laws and uh, administering these rights to consumers. First one is you have to have uh, what we like to call an intake method. So you have to have a website or uh, and a phone number that allow a consumer to call in, send an email, submit a form to submit these requests. And these requests can, uh, like I said before, be an access request. So the organization has to produce the data that they have on that consumer. Could be a deletion request, say, hey, please delete me from your systems, um, things of that nature. Um, And also just providing overall information to consumers. That's usually housed in a privacy policy to let the consumers know, hey, this is the information we collect on you. This is what it's used for. Uh, This is the information we may or may not sell to third parties. Uh, These are people that we share it with or the categories of people that we share it with. Um, So those are all new processes that organizations have to set up uh, because today there's really no request forms for data privacy, right? Uh, You might have an account login and a couple uh, settings, uh, but there's not a way to say, hey, give me your data. So that's something new that you have to set up is that intake. And then behind that, you have to set up all the back end processes, pulling that data putting it in a readily um, portable format, and then sending it back to those consumers. Um, So those are kind of like the big two areas uh, where we see impacts to organizations. So Danny, let me just, um, I have a whole bunch of questions, but I'll try to figure out the ones that make the most sense to me because this is a new issue um, to me. So if you're visiting California, and let's say it's me from Virginia, and I somehow get out to California, I can take advantage advantage of, I should say, this rule as a privacy. So it's not only the folks that live in California covers, but those using California establishments. Is that correct? Uh, Sorry, I should have been more clear. It's actually kind of the reverse of that. So it applies to only California residents wherever they may go. Gotcha. So if you're a California consumer and you fly over to New York, this applies to anyone you act with. Uh, interact with in New York, assuming that organization meets the criteria um, to hit CCPA. The criteria is that uh, your gross revenue is over 25 million. Uh, you annually buy, sell, or share more than 50,000 consumers worth of data, um, or you derive 50% or more of your annual annual revenue. Um, from the sale of consumer information. So um, realistically, we see most organizations that we deal with uh, passing the, the first one, gross revenues of over 25 million means that CCPA applies to you, even if you're in Texas or New York or Florida. Um, and it, it's specific to the California consumers that have these rights. So unfortunately, uh, myself being residing in Illinois, I don't have these rights uh, afforded to me just yet. Paige, gotcha. I want to follow up um, with something you were talking about with a cup of coffee, because I think that really, really gets at the core of convenience. Now, first off, that guy looking for his 11th cup that doesn't have um, the necessary cookies or whatever, he, he's arguing with a clerk and I'm behind him. I know that right now. Jeff, that is you, um, I think. Well, no, <laughs> uh, but uh, so so th- that's where the inconvenience comes in. So uh, not just for that person, but everyone behind that person. And so, Paige, how, how do we navigate when we want to have seamless transactions, when we want to be like that place like Cheers, where everybody knows your name? Um, but at the same time, we have to ask your permission, you know, can we say your name, essentially? How does this play out in convenience when everybody wants things faster and more seamless? That's a really good question, Jeff, because, you know, not all pieces of information is the same. And you can't have the same requirements, rights, and, and regulatory schemes for every type of data. And I think that's really important when you look at any type of regulatory or legislative scheme regarding privacy is not all information is the same. So there are basic pieces of information in order for you to conduct business um, that's basic. And I know that, you know, in its simplest form, it was thought, well, if you have um, pieces of information, wherever it moves regarding the transactional change, you have to get permission along the way and notify the consumer that you have that information. So let's say, um, hypothetically, you know, you're online and you want to order something. There's a, a mobile ordering platform with that retailer and, and they also have a delivery service and you have to provide um, your address um, to that delivery service so that you so your meal from that convenience store is delivered to you. 
Well, in some regulatory schemes, they would say you would have to, every step along the way, provide proactively permission to use that address. Does it make sense if the Anderson convenience store and I'm working with the delivery service that I have to go back and ask permission to the consumer for that information? Well, no, they expect that you are going to be handing over their home address to that delivery service so that they can get that food as quickly as possible. So it really comes down to a triage effect and really understanding what information is really required with certain security parameters. And you got to have a little bit of common sense in these um, in these regulatory regimes. So it sounds like if there isn't one thing, there's another you got to be thinking about. And so um, timing being one of them, and I know we, we're running a little low on that. So I wanted to ask one thing. Let's talk about timelines. I know you mentioned someone was delayed due to the, the um, coronavirus pandemic. What what dates should businesses have in mind or where should they also and um, where should they learn more about um, how to get up to speed, how to learn more about what to do and kind of recap some of this? Danny, I'll throw this at you first. Absolutely. So uh, the, the first date that's big has already passed, which was uh, January 1st and then July 1st for CCPA. It went live January 1st, uh, was uh, intended to go uh, be enforced July 1st. That was then delayed. Uh, and subsequently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, that uh, the regulations finally passed and CCPA is now being enforced. So, you know, if your organization is in scope for CCPA, uh, you could potentially uh, uh, be fined by California if you're not providing these rights to consumers. Um, other big dates to think about um, is, is really around when is the next state going to pass legislation. And fortunately, there's just not clear insight. Uh, obviously, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has slowed down legislation on both the, the state front as well as the federal front, which I know Paige can can talk to. But um, that, that's really what it is. If, if we haven't um, or if an organization hasn't met uh, the consumer privacy rights for California yet, you're actually kind of behind the eight ball, unfortunately. It's important to know with an issue as complex as privacy, um, unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon your perspective, it takes a long time to get it right. And a lot of folks here in Washington, D.C. really wanted to see how California implemented its law, how it's working um, before they move on federal legislation. Um, states like Washington and Oregon and Nevada and New York and Illinois um, are some states that are really anxious to get some type of state privacy um, legislation passed. But as Danny alluded to with COVID and the pandemic, um, you know, state legislative bodies are really focused on the recovery um, and not these other issues. So it will probably be um, 2021. I anticipate a very active state legislature, um, you know, different legislative privacies and, and there's our pop excuse me, priorities of which privacy will be a part of that. And I would anticipate at the federal side, um, we will start moving on privacy legislation as well. Um, all efforts to pass a federal bill essentially halted um, as soon as the pandemic hit in March. So um, we, we had anticipated, we thought there would be federal legislation worked on this year, um, but um, we'll be lucky if it starts next year. So it sounds like we'll be talking again. Um, and thank you both, Paige and Danny, for, for taking time with us to go over this. Now, the website where you can learn more, uh, as we mentioned, Connexus. Let me spell Connexus for you. C-O-N-1-N-E-X-X, two X's, U-S, Connexus.org. And for this research uh, resource, you go to Connexus.org slash resources slash data hyphen privacy. You'll find more there and more on the Connexus website as well, if not also looking at the next website. So thank you again, Danny. And thank you, Paige, for joining us today. And thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.